Welcome to the SVP Dallas workshop planning for 2021. My name is Prisma Garcia and I'm the Director of Capacity Building for Social Venture Partners Dallas. If you don't know SVP, SVP Dallas amplifies the impact of those out to do good. We're connecting and supporting philanthropists, nonprofits, and social enterprises to make a greater impact in North Texas. And so today we will have a, our SVP Dallas workshop, which we will explore how social impact organizations can plan and better prepare for 2021. Um, now more than ever with this pandemic, we need to prepare and um, these are key conversations for a successful new year. And this is whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit, we need to continue to execute our mission and avoid a pandemic drift, which I know so many of you have had to take bold risks and um, try make changes and, and pivot. Um, for in 2020. And so today we have a panel that will share with us some of their recommendations and best practices within the fields of legal, accounting, fundraising, programming, and so many other topics. Um, so today we have with us, um, and they will introduce themselves in, in more detail as we move through this um, webinar. But I, I just wanted to mention our featured speakers today. Um, we have Bob Wright. He's an SVP. He's our SVP founder and partner. Um, he's also a partner of Wright Kanatsur Law. We have Emily George. She's a CPA. She's also an SVP partner and director at BKD CPAs and Advisors. We have Bimet Mishishaya. Um, she is a DJR alum, and also she's the Director of Community Affairs at the State Fair of Texas. We have Melissa Baer, a vi Vice President of Corporate Engagement at United Way of Metropolitan Dallas. And we have Stacy Guillen, um, Director of Business Development at Canaries Incorporated. Today, I will be moderating this panel, and of course, we'll have our questions open and available for our audience to submit questions as you hear the speakers. And of course, we, want, we cannot do this alone, and we, I would like to thank our sponsors, Something Good Consulting Group, and of course, Ray Knatzer Law, um, for their continuous support of these programs. And of course, if you're on social media or you wanna share just some, something that's insightful to you, please use the hashtag SVPD workshop, and I will turn it over to our panel for some introductions. Hey, hi, Bob. Sorry to interrupt. Um, something is going on with your audio, but we will fix that and then we'll come back to you. So how about we turn it over to Emily George? Okay. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me start with that. Okay. Yes. Excellent. All right. So my name is Emily George. I'm excited to be here today. Thankful for this opportunity to talk to you all. I'm a director at BKD. BKD is a national CPA and accounting firm. It means we do audit, we do tax, advisory, and consulting services. BKD has um, about 40 offices in 18 states, and we have about $700 million in annual revenue and over 2,900 employees. So one of the industries that we specialize in and spend a lot of time in is nonprofit, and I'm lucky to get to spend a lot of time there too. I joined BKD probably two years ago now, a little bit over two years ago actually, to create our not-for-profit advisory services for the firm at the national level. In just a span of two years, we've gone from two employees in the beginning to 30, more than 30 employees now, uh, nine cities, seven states, so we rapidly expanded just because there was such a need in the community for these services. Today, I spend most of my time leading our DFW practice for the service line. All that to say, what is it we even do? Advisory can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Usually, the way I like to explain it is if it has to do with numbers and you're in a nonprofit, chances are we can help, we can find someone who can help, or we've done a project related to that before. A lot of times our services can take, you know, there's, there's a general bucket of projects we do. We can serve as the CFO where we come in and become either your full accounting department, part of your accounting department, budgeting, audit preparation, monthly close. We do a lot of operational assessments. What's right from a staffing structure? What's right with technology? 
We do a lot of implementations, whether that's, again, the technology side, we've seen a lot of that lately, or even the accounting standard, it's been a busy year for some nonprofits. And then we do um, internal controls, policies, procedures, and grant compliance. Today, we've seen a lot with grant compliance, particularly with the CARES funding that came out. We have the, the PPP funding. We're getting more and more federal funding, doing a lot of projects to make sure we're not double dipping on those expenses, that it's getting applied only to one funding source. And then, of course, as you can imagine, over the past you know, six, nine months now, we've done a ton of budgeting, modeling, forecasting, scenario planning, you name it. So that's a little bit about me and kind of what my experience is, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Emily. I'm, I'm sure that we'll get into detail um, there with all those topics you mentioned. Um, so I think now we'll move on to Bimet, and she can share with us a little bit more about herself. Sure. Thank you guys so much for having me and for um, putting this necessary conversation on. It's never too early to plan. And then the year that we've had <laughs> should plan very proactively. Um, like they shared, my name is Vendette Meshesha. I serve as the Director of Community Affairs at the State of Texas. I'm also the immediate past president of the Dallas-Fort Worth Urban League Young Professionals and the co-founder of Habesha's Vote. And I bring all of those up because it will come up in conversation today of how we prepare in all of these spaces, whether we're serving on a board or we're doing work in community um, or whether we have resources. Um, at the State Fair, I help manage our programming and our philanthropy work, um, really serving primarily South Dallas um, residents and organizations that are doing good work, building their capacities and offering them the support they need to be as impactful as possible. Um, and a little about me, I'm from the Dallas area by way of Ethiopia and so glad to um, be having conversations about rebuilding my community. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. And of course, I want to turn it back over to Bob. I think he's ready now. Um, Bob, are you ready? I'm ready. Um, I was ready last time. I just don't think my technology was ready. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bob Wright. Um, I'm an attorney, um, uh, even though I'm dressed as Bill Belichick today. Um, and um, I, um, years ago, 21 years ago, I, I founded Social Venture Partners. So I have a long um, um, tenure with the organization, have much fondness for it. Um, my um, life as a lawyer has been um, uh, pretty much in the corporate space. Um, I, in the last 10 or 15 years, have done a ton of work with nonprofit organizations and a lot of social enterprise work. In fact, I teach social enterprise at UTD and have done that since 2009. So it's become a bigger and bigger chunk of my life. So this is a great um, um, uh, uh, panel today. This is a great topic, something I'm really passionate about. Um, and something that um, hopefully um, I'll learn something with all of you um, today. So thank you very much. I look forward to this. Thank you, Bob. We learn something every day. And of course, you heard him. He is um, the SVP founder and he teaches a class. So definitely um, ask him a lot of hard questions. Um, so we're moving on to Melissa. Melissa, if you wouldn't mind providing a, an introduction. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm like Bob, excited about this panel. I think um, this is also a passion place for me, nonprofit, um, nonprofit management and growth. And with that, Melissa Baer, I am Vice President of Corporate Engagement. This is our corporate relations and volunteer engagement team, um, which is part of our resource development department. I, prior to this, I, for the last 20 years, have been a nonprofit in North Texas. Um, Different types of fundraising for sure, very, three di very diverse nonprofits, uh, the Simmons Corridor Business Association, the SC Dallas Foundation, and the National Rural Funders Collaborative. So um, very different, all of them very different. Excited to be at United Way, been here for two years now, um, came to United Way, I wanted to do what I could to further their mission, um, which is now my mission, and that is focusing in the areas of education, income, and health, uh, the building blocks of opportunity for all North Texans. Um, 
I'm proud because we're creating that positive change in this area by three different, many different ways. But um, of course, our community impact grants, we are in the middle of a three year cycle. We're on year two of uh, $15 million in funding to uh, roughly 122 nonprofits. Um, very excited about our programs though, that we have to fill those gaps um, not provided by our grants. And those are collaborations with other organizations. And um, we work with Cooper's Institute on um, our Healthy Zone schools. We work with um, a number of corporate funders and our financial stability work um, and a number of other collaboratives in the city, such as the North Texas Summer and Supper Council for our summer meals program. And we have a strong a social innovation accelerator. We just wrapped up our 2020, postponed, but wrapped up our 2020 cohort um, with our big uh, pitch event. If you've never joined that, you have to come April 21st to the 2021 pitch. Um, but this is an awesome opportunity for those that are making lasting change with innovative and new ideas. And um, we're, we're wanting to support those uh, nonprofit organizations. And, um, and finally excited, we are looking forward. 20, uh, of course, we're talking about planning for 2021. Um, in September, we announced our goals for our Aspire United 2030 goals. So we're even looking beyond that, but looking again, um, so lifting up everybody, no matter your race or your zip code so that everybody has the opportunities um, to, to live their best life. So excited to be here. Thank you, Melissa. Um, we're happy to have you here. And um, I'm sure that um, we'll all want to hear a lot more about what the United Way has planned um, and how you're preparing. Um, but with that, I'll turn it back. I'll turn it over to Stacy from Canaries. Thank you so much, Prisma and the Social Venture Partner teams and my, my fellow panelists. Thank you again for this courageous conversation and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as we all know, 2020 has been quite the year. I call it the year of reimagining human connection because we've been um, exercising different ways of connecting with one another. And so today I'm excited to share with you all um, about Canaries, about uh, just how we've planned um, and worked with companies and looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just a little bit about me, um, I'll definitely talk more about that. But um, again, my name is Stacey. I'm the Director of Business Development at Canaries. We are a black founded tech company here in Dallas. And we technically help organizations, whether it's not-for-profit, large enterprises, middle market, we help organizations create um, uh, clear metrics to optimize, diagnose, and benchmark diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. Um, as we all know, given the renewed focus on DEI this year and the different ecosystem and space that we're in, DEI is definitely on the rise for 2021. Um, and pretty much Canaries, we are a multifaceted uh, organization where uh, the platform can allow individual contributors to um, anonymously rate and review companies, right? Whether it's a former employer or current employer. And in that, the data that we have there, we provide our partner companies to better understand the challenges, right? Where are the areas of opportunity and the gaps? Where do we need to pivot to build a more inclusive workplace? Um, so I started my diversity, equity, inclusion career back when I was a healthcare administrator working for a large healthcare system. Um, I myself, uh, experienced some workplace inequities and that really drove me to make a change. It became a passion and now a career. And uh, from there, I worked for a large non-for-profit organization where I worked with companies and helped source top Hispanic talent, diverse talent. So again, I look forward to uh, sharing the DEI practices and patterns and trends for 2021 and planning for an exciting year. And thank you all for having me. Thank you, Stacy. We're, um, as everyone can tell now, that the panel is so diverse in, in, in the sense of different industries and expertise. And so 
In this next section of our webinar, what we do, and if this is the, your first workshop, um, you know, we typically have introductions and then we go into deeper dives because each panelist brings expertise um, to the table. And, and of course, I wanted to remind you that the Q&A is open and so you could submit questions as you're thinking of them and then we'll get to answer them live later on in the webinar. And so um, we're going to start off with Bob and, and I know that legal is everywhere, right? Um, you know, it's always been and, and especially now with the pandemic, we've had to think through so many different situations, um, so many different challenges, fears, um, anxieties, right? And so, Bob, if you if you wouldn't mind, we'll kick it back to you, and um, we can you could share with us some topics to think about as we're planning for 2021. Great, Prisma, thank you. And um, so let me, I think Prisma has teed this up well that um, in looking at 2021, it's impossible to imagine 2021 without um, an overlay of um, coronavirus and, and, and what does that mean to a planning session and how is that, how is planning different than it was a year ago? Um, and, you know, I don't think any of us a year ago expected that we'd have the 2020 that we had. Um, and, and looking forward at 2021, I don't think we have any better idea of what 2021 is going to look like but I think we can take some of the things that we learned about the drastic change between 2019 and 2020 and, and apply it to th our thinking about 2021. And to me, I, I, as I made notes and thought about this, the thing that kept coming back to me, really two words, one was resiliency and the other is flexibility and they are very closely related, but they're the two in my mind, watch words that we wanna make sure that we take into account when we're thinking about 2021. In 2020, we implemented um, from like March on a whole bunch of interim things that we hadn't really built into our, um, our ex expectations for 2020. Um, and uh, when everything changed, we had to think about things like how do we deal with a remote workforce? What happens when people come back to work? Um, how do I deal with employees who get sick? How do I look at my vendors? Because all of a sudden I've got vendors who can't fulfill the kinds of things that I was expected of them. And I've never had this kind of disruption in my supply chain before. What does this do to my organization from the standpoint of um, um, funding or sales, depending on what your revenue sources are? And so all of these things are kind of in play and we can talk a lot more about many of them, but the things that really strike me are um, a couple of things. One is, what do we take from the interim measures that we put in place in 2020 and how do we think about making them, quote, permanent or at least um, expected to be in play for all of 2021? And so we've got to look at staffing and the manner in which we deal with employees in the office and the way with, that we deal with remote employees, um, you know, what about, how does, how does a remote workforce um, change our thoughts about the technology that we need in order to um, support that remote workforce? Or, or how do I maintain culture? And all of these things, you know, they may not seem like they're legal, but all of them have legal aspects. And so I'm hopeful as we dig into this that we'll, be able to um, answer some concrete questions because it's um, we've never done this before. And when, when I say we, I'm talking about um, me as a lawyer as well, right? So um, I'm not, I don't bring any particular expertise to this other than 38 years of legal experience and a bunch of changing conditions over that time. But, you know, this is my first pandemic as well. So, um, uh, so if, with those two watchwords and then hopeful that we'll get some really concrete questions, those are the things I'm thinking about. Frankly, I'll tell you candidly, um, we, I have a law firm, it's Wright Knatzer, um, and we have 11 employees. And to me, I have learned as much about how to deal with this pandemic as a small business owner as I have by being a lawyer. Um, we, like many of you, took advantage of the PPP program 
Um, we, like many of you, have an economic injury disaster loan, um, you know, and, and learning um, how to deal with those from the perspective of an applicant was more important to me than um, anything I could have done by approaching it as a lawyer. So I'm going to be speaking today both as an attorney, but also as a small business owner, and um, hopefully we'll find a bunch of common ground. So Charisma, I'm going to turn it back to you, and I'm happy to talk more, in more detail about any of these things, but I think the most meaningful part for me may be responding to the questions that people throw at us. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. And I love your approach um, coming in with, you know, your legal expertise, but then also a small business um, owner, entrepreneur. And of course, we know that nonprofits are businesses. So we, um, we want to, you know, make sure that we're addressing all of these possible situations from our diverse audience. And so with that, um, Emily, I know everyone has a question about, you know, you mentioned even the loans. Um, everyone has a, a question about numbers, right? The financial aspects. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who um, is a CPA, and she can maybe share a little bit more um, nuggets um, and then, you know, follow up later with questions. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I am gonna be my, my typical CPA self first and go ahead and get the risk side of the conversation out of the way. So with all the creativity that I have seen in the industry, how are we gonna fundraise? How is business changing? All of these new practices, I just wanna throw caution and, and make sure as you're planning these for 2021, you're also asking what is the risk to the organization? Do we have the right legal considerations? Do we have the right infrastructure considerations? Let's just really make sure and not, not push too far into something new without taking the, taking the time to think through the risk. Okay, so now I've gotten that out of the way. Um, we can I can move on and talk freely about budgeting. And Bob, I really liked what you said about what can we take that we've learned in 2020 and how can we apply that moving forward in 2021? And it has been a very busy year for everyone. It's been especially busy though for your finance and your accounting associates and executives. Where we normally budget once a year, I, I know quite a few organizations have gotten very good at budgeting <laughs> at least twice this past year, maybe two, three, four times, depending on how frequently you've had to go and look at your budget. And that is not a light process. And not only are we budgeting, we're having to build scenarios into our budget planning. So where before, you know, we thought we were going to have these expenses because we'd always had these expenses. Now we've had to look at, okay, we don't know what we're necessarily going to have. We really have to start from the bottom and build our way up. And so one of the things that I saw happen in the not-for-profit space when we had to start making hard decisions was going back to our strategic plan and back to our mission and really budgeting and carrying on with our activity with that in mind. So I think that is a great thing that we have, we've gone back to and learned how to do and we need to keep that momentum moving forward into 2021. I don't think we're done with the hard decisions yet. And, and Bob, another great point, we've got to figure out with some of the interim stuff we had in place, what our long-term strategy may need to be now. And we're gonna to have to keep making uh, impactful decisions and long lasting decisions. So building that mission and those strategic goals into your budgeting process is something that if you've never done or never necessarily had to do, you can definitely do now and moving forward. Another thing in the, in the budgeting process is making sure we're asking why. Uh, start, you know, be the, be the question person. Why have we incurred this expense? you ever get the answer, I don't know, or because it always was, this is the perfect time to kind of start over from scratch. And then lastly, in, in budgeting, and then I'll kind of move on to the last piece of significant change we've seen, um, is how do you budget for the unknown? How, how do we account for what we can't account for? And I have seen many more entities in, uh, bring in a, maybe a, uncertainty line item or a contingency line item into their budget. Maybe we're looking less particular by line item, but the overall outcome. And you've got to continue to monitor that. It can be really easy for us to get, frankly, exhausted, tired. We've done it. We've set our budget. We're good. 
we have to keep watching our budget. We have to keep seeing how we're doing compared to our expectations. And we've got to be ready to react. We can do a lot of scenario modeling ahead of time. The nonprofits that had this as part of their infrastructure were able to adapt very quickly. So it's kind of like a muscle you get to exercise and we're getting a lot of, of opportunity to work out right now. Um, and then with that, kind of the last thing we've seen, and I want to make sure we don't skip over too much, is the technology aspect, especially on a business operations side, the financial, the accounting side. We had a lot of people go from still doing things in office to now having to be cloud, remote, needing new solutions to be able to do what they have always done. And with that came a lot of very rapid changes. And maybe it wasn't set up in the best infrastructure. We had to get something in place and we had to move on. Maybe we, we put a, a Band-Aid on it and we made it work. And we're looking at 2021 20, and trying to make a decision about our investment. Technology is only as good as the people who are using it. So make sure that if you're gonna go with technology, you are not just doing it to doing it, not just doing it to do it, but you're putting the investment in on the front end to get out of it what you need on the back end. I've been on the other side of a couple of technology implementations where there was a lot of concern for the cost up front and trying to take some shortcuts in the beginning. And that can be three to four times more costly on the back end. So you definitely will get an ROI on some of those technology investments. So if you're going to do them, take the time to do them well. The other thing with that though, is let's make sure we prioritize because there's a ton we want to do and we need to do. And the organizations that are gonna be most successful are the ones that don't try to do it all, but do the things that are really gonna have an impact. And, and that can be hard sometimes. I mean, Bob, you said it yourself, we've gotta learn PPP regulations now. That was not in my timeline for 2020. You know, We're still trying to figure out how to file for forgiveness in 2021 let's make sure we're prioritizing those things that are gonna have the biggest impact on our financials, on our organization, and really giving those the effort and the energy they deserve. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context from what we've seen over the last few months and what we expect to see and, and have learned that we can carry forward and take into 2021. Thank you, Emily. I know that with, um, and I think you and Bob mentioned it as once in a lifetime, right, kind of global pandemic, and there's volatility, and a lot of unrest. And I know that um, I, I learned something just now with uncertainty, right, adding that as a line item. And so um, you also mentioned impact. And I think our next speaker, um, Melissa, will tell us a lot more about impact and also what it means to those nonprofits and, and maybe even for profits that are looking to make investments or donations. So with that, um, Melissa, if, if you wouldn't mind going into your deeper dive. Absolutely. Uh, so thinking about planning 2021, um, three things come to mind. And I think for me, the first is, um, and just like Emily was touching on, is looking at the trends of the last eight months. If you're, um, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to be planning and your fiscal year runs the same as your calendar year, you might not seem lucky, but you are because those that were planning a fiscal year June or July to June, last April, like we were, we didn't have the type of trends to look at. The, um, the country just shut down, the, the city shut down. And so you're looking at how do you set goals when your fiscal year is right around the corner and, and you're just started a pandemic. Um, I like to call it informed uncertainty. And that's now um, where I think a lot of people are in setting their goals for next year and, um, and looking at their fundraising sources. Um, so along with following those goals, diversifying, diversifying your fundraising strategy is key. Um, and this isn't only where the money comes from, but how much you allocate coming from that revenue source. Um, for United Way, uh, we, of course, workplace campaigns. We, um, our big busy season is in the fall. So um, we're watching the trends that we had. And fortunately, not as many companies as I thought were, were dropping off. We had a number of campaigns um, that came in as new campaigns as well. And that shows the giving on a corporate level and the commitment on the employee level. Um, the other fundraising stream that has been crucial is um, corporate gifts and sponsorships. Um, you know, obviously there has been the, the um, 
the push to show your CSR to your shareholders and where you're giving your funds. Um, but with the pandemic, it came into coronavirus response and recovery funds and giving and what, excuse me, where that money needs to go. Um, the other piece of it is in the middle of the pandemic and murder hornets and everything else, you have the, the social injustice bubble that popped. And so with that, companies are looking at where, where do I spend my racial equity dollars? Um, where can I invest in not only internally looking at their investment as far as their workforce and, um, and the makeup of their organization, but what, what organizations out there are focusing on communities of color? Um, what, you know, a, a number of companies, uh, Pepsi comes to mind, they've chosen to look at communities or look at nonprofits that actually have um, the leadership of color. So that's a, that's a crucial piece that I think um, has really changed in 2020 is the more that you're seeing funds shifted um, towards these type of long-term needs like this. And um, with that grants, government grants, government loans, and um, of course we, we mentioned PPP and, um, and that's a whole, that's a whole other world uh, for me. But the, um, on the grant side, seeing these coronavirus response and recovery funds come into play is huge. Um, really, I was proud of United Way. We, um, and proud of our corporate partners and our other individual funders, um, really stepped up in the early spring and uh, raised over $4 million um, that we were able to then donate to 314 nonprofits um, with an impact of 1.4 million people. And, and that's just the initial, the initial response. Um, with that as well, um, we started a collaborative with a number of funding organizations, over 30, which is amazing, um, called North Texas Cares. And that provided one central portal for nonprofits to, um, to apply for funding. And I've been on that side of where you're filling out the grants and especially in a time of emergency and uncertainty, I can't even imagine. So to have something like North Texas Cares is huge. Um, and with that, it's over $50 million that have been given through that collaborative to uh, North Texas nonprofits. Um, you know, there's been a, um, One Star Foundation did a, a uh, Study. And they were talking about, and, and some obvious points that came out of that is just what the nonprofit landscape looks like and how that's affecting, you know, the financial instability now of nonprofits. Um, but sustaining that workforce, there is a huge vital workforce within nonprofits. And so um, how do you sustain that? And that's through loans and such, but I think also asking for flexible funding from all of these sources. Um, it's not just to one program, one programmatic way, but what, where is that flexible, that flexible funding? And um, individuals, a funding stream for United Way, we, um, we are fortunate to have a number of um, individuals that give to United Way and have been for a long time and new, new people that are learning about the work that we're doing um, because, uh, I feel we're doing a really good job of telling our story and talking about the work that that's happening. Um, and then as we know, and social venture partners very active um, in bringing this to the forefront, impact investing. And that is something over the last year um, before COVID um, we were looking you know, into. And so, um, so I'm excited that we are also getting into that because that is going to allow for like Emily said, um, that uncertainty line item that um, some at your house might call it your rainy day, um, but that is um, that is a place to provide for that long term. Um, and then in this diversity is where do you, you know there's all these different funding streams, but how much should you plan on receiving or, or going after for your um, for your stability? Um, I think some you know a lot of nonprofits look at event fundraising as a you know a main source and that was deeply cut this past year and um the word you know bob mentioned resilience and um flexibility um i know pivot is the buzzword um but creativity has been so huge this year and i have been so impressed and no place more than in events 
Um, and it is not just events such as this where you're, um, where you're teaching and giving resources, but fundraising events. And so while you might not wanna put as, as many eggs in that basket, at the same time, looking at how you can do that creatively, looking at best practices so that, so it can still be a strong pipeline for you. Um, and then grants, you know, seeking out for your piece of the pie, what grants make sense for long-term, not just your short-term programmatic work. Um, the same with major corporate gifts, a number of corporate foundations um, that I know I've seen is they've been entering kind of the new funding space more than they have, or maybe you just hear about them more. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and then, you know, is your piece of the pie, can you grow it with your individual fundraisers? Can you make that ask of lapsed donors perhaps that, you know, maybe they got lost along the way and, and you call them back up and say, hey, you know, we're really in need, you've supported us in the past, you know, come back and see what we're doing. Um, and then the third, um, the third thing I'd say about planning is tell your story. And, and we know that as, as nonprofit professionals, those that, that work in that space, you know it, but I don't think there has ever been a greater time to tell your story and tell your COVID story. Tell the story of your clients um, whose lives are being affected and how you're being a part of the solution. And that impact is huge. And I think with United Way, um, I know with United Way, that is something that, that we've really focused on is, is tying everything back to impact. So um, that's where you can show, you know, exactly the evaluation of your dollars and, and where people's funding, you know, will end up. So um, I think that also comes into play with your, your end of year giving. So here we are and we're focused on the holidays. And so what does that look like? I would say, again, story, you know, and not COVID story, but making that, that end of year plea and, and no time than now is that more important. Thank you, Melissa. And I don't, I don't know how the numbers will change, but typically one third, sometimes even up to one third of the annual giving comes through in, in December. And and Emily might have other stats for me, but um, you know, I think we're all, um, you know, we're all getting to the end of year, and we need to be thinking about, or maybe hopefully we've already been planning for, for those appeals. Um, with that, um, I know that. Um, we keep hearing DEI. Um, I know within the nonprofit community, um, we've, you know, it's been, equity has been something that we've talked about, um, you know, and, and try to do now for some time, in particular at SVP, right, offering trainings and, and different um, workshops for our nonprofits. But um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy, which, you know, Canaries is actually. Um, an investee of SVP Dallas. And so we're, we're happy to have Canaries um, and Stacy here today. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. I, um, I appreciate what Emily, Bob, Melissa, I know that you uh, alluded to some of the racial equity, diversity and inclusion. And I, I, I want you to stop for a minute and maybe breathe, right? Because it's been such a tough year. And I, I know I'm, I'm a very transparent person, so <laughs> uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm too much here, but I think that uh, first and foremost, we have to extend gratitude and compassion. It's not only been such a psychologically a tough year for us personally, but also professionally. Here at Canaries, it's funny, you know, we, we, you, we usually say, hey, you know, you need to stop. It, we used to call it work from home. Now we call it live at work, right? And trying to blur the lines because our lives are now like, you know, blur between professional and, and, and personal. But I think that a lot of that also is uh, carrying over to us professionally, right? Trying to understand, acknowledge what took place this year and is still taking place. 2020 is not over yet. Um, but how do we carry all of those lessons learned to 2021, right? On a personal and professional note from looking at it in a DEI lens, diversity, equity, inclusion. So I have a few notes here. So forgive me, I'm gonna be looking up and down because there's I have so much to share with you all with what we've been hearing at Canaries through companies, uh, whether it's also not-for-profits, uh, also companies that are middle market are in growth mode. Um, every company comes from a different stage in the DEI journey where we call it early on 
in between in the middle and then mature. So I, I said here, compassion and gratitude, but the other word that we've been hearing is intentionality, being intentional and looking, reviewing your, at your policies and procedures, being intentional about your workplace. We here at Canary say that you have to look at uh, being more savvy, right? And work where you belong. You want to work where you belong. So uh, in, in terms of intentionality, uh, recently Deloitte uh, published a, um, a series here about CEOs and what do they see as an important area for 2021. And it did not surprise me when I saw this, and it, it really aligns to what we're seeing now here at Canaries, that diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives are on the rise, meaning that 96% of CEOs, and these are CEOs that range between non-for-profits um, and large enterprises and middle market, that they agree that DEI is a strategic priority and goal for them. And the top three goals within those initiatives are DEI, data and metrics for transparency, and I'll talk more about that and how uh, how we're doing, how Canaries is helping with that. Uh, talent recruitment and retention and advancement, professional advancement. And then third is internal policies and, and, and processes. So these three, um, and I'm more than happy to share this uh, so that way I, I know that everyone's trying to take copious notes here. But first and foremost, we hear from a lot of companies. Okay, Stacy, we feel like we're fine in the, in the workplace diversity, right? From looking at from an objective standpoint, how do we transition over now? We want to evolve and look into inclusion and equity, right? So de by definition, the inclusion is making sure that your workplace or employees feel like their voice is being heard. You may hear it, some, some companies say belongingness or a sense of community. So right now, the trend that we see in 2020, of course, given the inflection point, I mean, we, we, we can um, miss on the fact that, you know, this summer, a lot of incidents took place that really shifted companies and individuals to just look at things in a different manner. And so given the renewed focus, companies are now shifting over from diversity to inclusion, looking how they can create a safe and inclusive workplace. And then equity, making sure that their policies and benefits are set up for success for every employee equally. So we do notice that trend in inclusion and equity. Um, in addition to that, um, the metrics. We hear a lot of companies saying, okay, well, that's wonderful. We're looking at equity inclusion. How do we measure it? And that's where at Canaries, we, our platform has been able to transform and assist companies in looking at the different metrics and how to deploy assessments um, and create a platform where it's safe for, for the employee to share their sentiments, to share um, their live work experiences. So we're not looking at safety from, a, you know, of course, physical standpoint, where a lot of the companies have shifted to remote work, but also looking at psychological safety. It's a, a, a term that I've been hearing in the past three months, where psychological safety, by definition, and it's, it's different in, in, in many companies, but overall, psychological safety is instilling, creating an environment where people feel that they can candidly just ask questions, they can provide ideas, um, address their concerns, uh, and even their mistakes, right? Having that culture where you can have inclusion in a way where individuals feel like they can be authentically themselves. So that's something that we've been uh, working with companies. Um, I invite you all to join or uh, check out resources.canaries.com. Uh, that is a, a place where we provide toolkits, guides um, to start the journey or to fuel or amplify your initiatives and, res uh, initiatives and, and efforts. Um, to at least start looking into or exploring what does that mean for my organization? How do I create that environment? Um, another um, thing that we've been hearing lately, and I know that some of us here um, is moving from unconscious bias to anti-racism courses and training. So that is another uh, trend that we've recently been seeing from companies where they're looking to be okay, having those courageous conversations, those uncomfortable conversations. So that's another thing as well. And just driving systemic, systemic change, really making an impact through uh, the assessments, through um, allowing uh, employees to share their, their experiences uh, day in and day out. Um, another thing that I also wanted to share, uh, the Business Roundtable recently um, announced there that companies are now annually looking at pay equity, right? They're looking at those audits. 
Um, CEO Action has also shared that it is very important for companies to annually, you know, look intentionally look at uh, what that pay is for all of the employees. Um, I have so much here, so just bear with me as I go through my list. Um, one of the things that we also are sharing with our company partners and the individuals that come to speak to us at Canaries is um, just being okay with displaying your policies and statements publicly. We saw that a lot, those well-meaning statements in, in June, right? But now employees are asking action. They're looking for action. What exactly are companies doing to, to drive or at least to be truthful in their statements? So uh, we are working with them. We have a few companies that are that we're working in, in terms of what are those statements translate when it comes to DEI planning, strategic planning. Um, another thing is that we also have seen is using social media as a tool for companies to portray your to portray your values. Right, uh, companies are committed to DEI. They often post about it in in social about social injustices, important issues that are trending in the news. Um, we find that it's a great way to show that the company is aware. It's all about awareness. Um, also, what we find uh, that we've been learning and companies always ask us is, what are the first steps to make, um, to make us demonstrate the long-term commitment in D&I or just to continue the growth? And the first question we always tell them to consider is your employee makeup. It all starts internally and then externally, right? So leadership team, how is that reflective of the communities that you serve? So Melissa, I know you touched upon this, right? Um, representation and inclusion does matter. Um, we find that diverse and inclusive uh, teams do uh, impact financial performance. They do in product innovation. Uh, they impact team collaboration. So I know some of us know the business case, but I just wanted to emphasize the importance of that. Um, in addition to it, uh, we've also been um, asked about, well, what exactly can we do to start or at least instill a place that is safe, right? So everyone is talking about inclusivity, equality, but now I, I know I alluded to uh, psychological safety, but safety has transformed in so many ways in the sense that, you know, we're dealing and we're in the middle of a pandemic um, and seeing that the, the numbers are going up. So having that psychological standpoint, how does that impact productivity? So at Canaries, we um, have found, and we're very mindful of this because inclusivity also impacts us through video, right? We have a, a lot of individuals that tell us, well, you know, we may not feel comfortable showing our homes or um, showing just a self that we didn't do before, right? So we do always, uh, we're mindful of the fact that if, if someone doesn't feel comfortable using their camera, we say that's fine. That's, so it's all part of that inclusivity. So all ab above everything, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, but you know, it's, it's no surprise that it's going to only rise for 2021 and preparing yourself in what your employees may ask and creating an environment where they can ask. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna leave it there and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions, but um, feel free again to just visit us at resources.canaries.com for additional toolkits and resources on moving the needle forward for DNI. Thanks, Stacy. And I know the, um, you know, there is also a tool, um, implicit.harvard.edu. If you want to take a implicit bias test, um, you can check that out. I know um, it's important to know what, um, you know, more learn more about ourselves before we're out there serving communities. Um, and with that, I know that um, BIMnet is a, a big fan of equity um, and these trainings um, and these conversations. So I'm going to turn it over to her to, so she could share more about the State Fair of Texas and what she's um, working on there. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it's already been a powerful conversation. I've been taking notes as they've been sharing. So hopefully I can kind of build on that. Um, I do want to acknowledge a couple of realities um, in the context of these conversations. Um, at the State Fair of Texas, like I mentioned, we work in the South Dallas um, Fair Park area, so that immediate area where the fair is. Let me apologize now since I didn't get to say it earlier. I'm so sorry, guys. We didn't have a fair for y'all to come to. I hope that you were able to make the drive through fair, and we are looking forward to hosting you next year, bigger and better, but we're glad you all stayed safe. Um, 
But one of the realities that's true for the communities we serve is that they are primarily um, black and brown um, clients that we serve, um, but also the organizations we support are primarily led by black and brown leaders, right? And so there was a, a reference to that earlier. And um, the truth is that a lot of our foundations, a lot of our funders um, don't primarily support, at least here in Dallas, organizations that are led by people of color. That's our reality, right? We have an incredible amount of wealth and resources in the Dallas-Fort Worth community, but they do not usually go to organizations that are um, led by black and brown people for a number of reasons, but that is an area we have to do better on, right? Because we have to support those who are proximal, who have cultural competence, the knowledge, the access to those people that are being served. And so we are so intentional about the resources we have at the fair, the partnerships we develop. And so over 90% of the people we fund that we partner with are primarily black and brown leaders, black and brown organizations. So what does that mean? That means that it gives us uh, access to the specific and unique issues that they have, which are compounded, right? Like one of the things is like social capital, right? Like the relationships and the networks that these organizations have tend to be lower because of not only their race, but their socioeconomic status. They tend to be smaller nonprofits, right? Not with a lot of budgets, not with a lot of donors, not with, but they are doing twice the work with half of the resources. And that's just the truth, right? Maybe against a nonprofit serving a similar demographic north of 30. Um, and so our group and the people we have served had to be very resilient, very innovative, very creative to stretch the very few resources that they have. Um, and one of the ways that I want to uplift that is the value of unique partnerships. I think we have seen people partner, um, even partnerships maybe you wouldn't expect or anticipate, right? We've seen more public and private partnerships. We've seen, um, more cross-discipline partnerships. I love like, you know, we need to be thinking about how schools and a chamber and a nonprofit can work together in accomplishing their same collective goals for um, education, right? Or um, seeing maybe a hospital, a bike club and a food pantry. How are those related? They're very related, right? They have a health goal. And so we're seeing organizations that are really coming together and pulling their resources because of how limited it is and, and really targeting their demographic to make sure that the client is not suffering um, in this time and making sure there's enough wraparound services. One of the um, events that took place in the summer repeatedly was a partnership with like Carter's House, which provides clothing. Um, I look like love, which provides diapers for single and young and expecting mothers, um, the Census Bureau, the YMCA and Miles of Freedom, right? You're like, how do those come together? Well, they did a food drive. When they did the food drive, somebody was making sure that these communities were counted for the census, which was an important work because we didn't have any dollars allocated by our state to making sure these undercounted or underrepresented groups were, right? And so um, I think we have to think very creatively and proactively now. I would challenge you guys to say, what partnership am I missing in my organization, right? Like who is missing from the kind of work that we do and where can I build that strategically in the next two to three months, right? Who do I need introductions to? What kind of organizations? If I really have it pat down with serving students, but um, I really need um, more support um, in, um, the technology aspect because of the families that I'm serving, right? Like, so it's even beyond what service do I offer, but what service do my clients need that I'm unable to fulfill that I can partner with to make sure that those needs are met. And so I think the value of unique partnerships is very important. Um, we're so glad I'm at the State Fair. We've been able to launch something called Serve Southern Dallas. Um, you could go visit that. It lists a bunch of organizations in the South Dallas Fair Park, but actually quite honestly, the Southern sector of Dallas, these are incredible organizations doing phenomenal work and need your help. So you can find out how to donate, you can find out how to volunteer with them. We created this site to amplify their voice because these small to mid-sized orgs that are being led by black and brown people usually won't have the infrastructure to apply for big dollars, but they are no less doing the work, right? And so how do we center them? How do we bring them along? So absolutely um, just continuing to build on unique partnerships that you can have. Um, there were conversations that came up um, about PPE, right? And uh, pl planning financially for that and benefits around that. But the reality is there were some groups who were suffering incredibly in this Metroplex who couldn't benefit. 
those are immigrants, right? Undocumented groups of people could not benefit from a stimulus check, right? Or have access to some of these necessary resources, but they were no less in need, right? Um, so I think even just the disparity in, even when there are resources, the accessibility is not the same for everyone. So what is our responsibility as nonprofit leaders, as community leaders, to make sure that our neighbors, right? The humanity next door to us still has access things even if what um, the infrastructures or the policies that exist excludes them right because that's on us too um a second part i want to talk about is engaging young people and diverse groups as a part of a solution and a strategy for 2021 um, i have the privilege of overseeing all of our education portfolio at the state fair of texas so this looks like our direct programming the partnerships we have with south isd schools it's on an annual event we engage about 15 Southern sector high schools, right? Um, so I'm deep into this work with students. And one of the things that I know to be true is that sometimes we are telling them to wait to be leaders for tomorrow. And I often find adults who say that they're you're the leaders of tomorrow. Actually, they're the leaders of today, right? They are currently living this reality. Um, they probably have way more to tell us and educate us about their experience of navigating being a student an employee right in this pandemic more so than we have. I will be the first to say I am so glad I'm not a high school student in the year of 2020, right? I don't know what it feels like to not have prom, to not graduate from high school, right? Like these milestones that are significant to um, our growth or to have hope going into your senior year in a pandemic. What does that even mean, right? Um, we are currently kind of in the health and the financial aspect of the pandemic, right? Those crises. But what is coming next is a housing crisis and what will follow that is a mental health crisis, right? Like we haven't even scratched the surface on those things and our students are going to be equally as a part of that journey as our adults are. Um, and so I would love for, you know, for everyone that's listening to think about how will you partner with students? How will you include them in your strategy for creating solutions. They are brilliant. They have so many amazing things to say. They are navigating it better than most adults that I know, right? And so what would it look like if we gave them a seat at the table? What would it look like if we invited them to and through that planning process and not just dictating the future for them? The reality is we are in a disaster, right? And we are in the response phase of it, but eventually we're gonna work through and get to the rebuilding phase. The rebuilding phase of a disaster usually takes for up to 10 years for one community. This is not, even as we begin to have vaccines and other solutions, the ramifications of what is happening in this year will likely be around for a decade, truthfully, right? So what does it mean if we involve young people now, right? A 15 year old now will be 25 by the time we're done. A 10 year old will be 20, right? What would it look like if we engaged them as responsible citizens in this process. That means we're gonna have more stakeholders and allies and partners in continuing to solve for this work. And I know one thing is that young people are ready and fired up to change our world, right? We just have to see them as a valuable partner in that process. So if you're not partnering with students, whether on your board and advisory committee in a school, some capacity, then your solution is not going to be sustainable in long-term five and 10 years from now you are not going to be engaging the people who are going to be taking over, right? And so it's our responsibility, I think, to do that. And the diverse groups, right? I think um, someone hinted on it. Um, it might've been Melissa who was talking about now needing to center um, organizations that are led by people of color. There are phenomenal organizations that are not only led by people of color, but primarily serve people of color that are made up of memberships of people of color. The Urban League being one, the Latino Cultural Center being another, right? Like there's uh, NESBY, National Society of Black Engineers, right? There are so many affinity groups that exist that have been doing this work, but have not been undergirded and supported. This is a great time to do that. This is a great time to build bridges and relationships with your employee resource groups of corporations, right? Or as entities. And so drawing close intentionally into that, not only to offer support, but to learn. Right. Like, again, they have so much to share. And then I've already talked about this, but just kind of rebuilding beyond this 2021. Um, I think prior to this year, perhaps we've had some trepidation and we've had maybe some privileges that have allowed us to maintain the status quo, to allow some injustices in our workplaces, in our corporations, and our nonprofits to maintain. Right. 
and the unjust killings of black and brown people by police officers in the summer that we saw on TV really challenged us to change and to maybe reckon with that acceptance, right? And I think my encouragement for people planning for 2021 is if you have been putting it off, if you have felt uncomfortable, if you have felt like, oh, I don't really want to get into that, this is a wonderful time to just put that aside, to just blow up that plan and get into it. This is not going away. And quite honestly, we shouldn't be okay with it. It shouldn't have been this long, right? It shouldn't have taken these things for us to have these dialogues, but now we are. And you have some additional support. You have momentum on your side. This is a moment to be reflective, to go back and evaluate your internal organization, your processes, your culture, your problematic staff people, right? And say, who are we going to be, right? Who do we want to be when this pandemic is over? And maybe the courage we haven't had prior to this moment is so important for you guys to go back and say, no, we're gonna tackle that now. And it's gonna start with us learning. And then we're gonna make some important and bold decisions that will sustain it. Otherwise, our world is very collective, right? Like it's interdependent. Our stories are woven one to another. The reality of my neighbor over there will affect my business, will affect my profitability, it will affect my safety, it'll affect the climate in which I wanna start a business here, right? And so I think if you have had just any hesitation or lack of clarity, I just hope this is an encouragement to just say, this is it, this is the year, right? In 2020, we're gonna plan to address those things that have kind of been holding holding us back and particularly our staff and team members of color back too. So um, those are probably my three things, you know, value of unique relationships, engage young people in diverse groups and rebuild beyond 2021 with an intentional plan to blow up all of the comfort, relaxation, trepidation, hesitancy, and just boldly address the things that need to be addressed first by looking in the mirror. Thank you. Um, all obviously we've all been taking notes. I think everyone on, on the panel shared so many different um, things that we can put on our to-do list. And I know that um, people in the audience are, are starting to submit questions and now is the time for questions. And so I'm going to, you know, really um, focus on, on the to-do list, right? Because I know that some of these things are getting done, but, um, Sometimes it's hard to know, like, with this shift, how do I prepare? How do I properly, like, make even that to-do list? And I know that we've started to to hear some of these um, items that we're adding. But in particular, I want to go back to the legal and the financial areas, right? Um, so, Emily, if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, sharing maybe some of the things that need to be on that CFO list, right? What What's going to be on your list now? What should, should you maybe have started in September, but maybe you could still get it in before the end of 2020. Um, and a lot of our nonprofits, they don't always have, a, you know, a person in the role to be a CFO. So sometimes it's a fractional CFO or maybe, maybe it's the executive director doing it all. So Emily, if you wouldn't mind jumping in and sharing with us maybe a little bit more ab about what they could be adding to their to-do list. Yeah, happy to. Well, after listening to everyone who talked after me, I think the to-do list just got a lot longer, right? And I mean, just listening to Bimnet, I mean, we could all go back and, and make sure as part of our strategic initiatives and part of our goals, you know, the pay gap, the pay scale, that is a finance related function and project. And I am fortunate to work with organizations that are doing that and are doing it now, but there's probably a lot of people that aren't doing it or haven't intentionally done that or made that part of an annual process. So that is one great thing to already put on a to-do list. We talked a lot about funding streams and compl um, the compliance with that. So if you've taken on New funding, the PPP is not going to fall off of anyone's to do list, but that is definitely on there as well. And as we head into 2021, things aren't going to stop changing. So the best thing we can do is to stay focused on where do you get your information from? Do you have, you know, BKD has more than enough instances of what we call it thoughtware news that goes out that gives you what you need to know based on what's applicable to you. But what is your resource to get that information so that you are not getting caught kind of behind the curve, you're keeping it on the front end. And, and if you've gone through budgeting and um, planning already, a lot of our 1231 year ends have, and if it was painful, 
you may be putting on your to-do list, buy new software that will help me do this process in the future. So that may come up as something as well. Um, but all in all, I, I think the best thing anyone could do for their to-do list is listen to some of what we learned in this session today and make sure we're addressing those items. Thank you, Emily. I, I know that with with those considerations, I mean, there are some people out there that might be starting, I mean, maybe you're in the middle of starting your nonprofit or your business, and your small business, and, you know, then the pandemic hit in March, and you were sort of um, maybe had some hesitation and your plan shifted. Um, Bob, what would you say, um, just based on everything we've heard and discussed, and, and as you've been thinking through, what is, you know, maybe a top recommendation you have for nonprofits um, any advice to them or those thinking about starting nonprofits or small businesses during this time? I have a couple of thoughts with regard to that. Um, one is the thought that always comes to mind when I talk to people about starting nonprofits, which is really, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so, and, and I think that's never been more true than it is today, um, you know, um, there are lots of um, nonprofits and there are lots of initiatives that don't really need to be replicated. And so that is particularly true in a market where, um, the, where your survival is uncertain at best. And so I would encourage you, if you're thinking about starting a nonprofit, to make sure that you do a survey of the environment to see whether that's something that you really want to do. Um, having said that, however, there's plenty of opportunity and plenty of unaddressed needs. And so if you um, have done your survey and then you turn to the market and say, what I really want to provide is missing in this market, then I would look for the ways to start those nonprofits in the least risky way. So are there programs that exist in other places that can be imported into our economy? Um, are there um, um, particular funding groups? Is there a way at the outset to actually um, pair up with somebody who has an interest in the space so that I'm not just another nonprofit leader who is standing in the long line of nonprofit leaders that, that the usual suspects who are funders. So if I think what I'm trying to get at is there's never been a more important time to be thoughtful and strategic. And, um, and this is, uh, that, that's what I would say to somebody who is thinking about starting a nonprofit today, those who already have them. Um, I think this is, I started out by saying it's a time for flexibility and, and, and um, re resilience. And oftentimes flexibility and resilience is found in diversity. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about diversity here today. We've talked about it in terms of people diversity, but I think diversity should run through your organization from funding sources to vendors to suppliers. Um, all of those um, seek to reduce risk. And this is a time when we, I think, need to have our eye on where can I reduce risk in order to take um, advantage of opportunity. And that's the last thing I want to say. You know, this has been a period of great change and great change causes great disruption and great disruption um, engenders a time of great opportunity. And so um, while it's been very um, um, uh, uh, disruptive and cataclysmic and I've heard the word disastrous and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I wouldn't say that any of that isn't true. I would also say that there's a tremendous opportunity and they exist everywhere. And so if we can have our eye um, alert to um, um, where, the, where opportunities might arise because of, uh, as, uh, because of all this, I think it's a really exciting time. Thank you, Bob. You're so hopeful. You're providing us so much inspiration. And I know the, that in particular for our nonprofits, they, you know, we talked a little bit about it and I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa to see, to hear more about how nonprofits can continue to measure their impact because I know that it is timely and, and we have to continue to be effective in the work that we do with an increased need. And so Melissa, if you could provide maybe, um, you know, just some examples or recommendations for nonprofits and their impact. Yes, and well, and I think, I, you know, just like Bennett said on the status quo, status quo kind of um, 
happily was shaken up this year and that's in all ways. And, and so I think also in, in impact. And I think the biggest thing that, that we can do with impact is, um, is evaluation and showing, you know, where, number one, who we're impacting and, and what that looks like. Um, and right now the areas of education, income and health um, you know, if you think about it, those, of course, those are the building blocks of, of your life, but then those have never been more affected um, on a large scale than they are right now. And so um, that's where organizations that have been working, you've been doing this work all along. United Way has been in this space all along. Now it has just the status quo got shaken up and now it went deeper. And so, um, and so being able to show that impact and that evaluation um, is going to be huge to help you through your fundraising to help you build that story. Um, you know, it's it was sad to see on CNN yesterday, um, or maybe that was this morning, that the uh, the longest line for the food bank, um, and they were showing the big distribution here in our community, um, and. At the same time, that's showing impact. That's showing impact of all those funders that that got together to make that happen, and of course, the North Texas Food Bank as well. Um, and I, and I think that's going to be key for us is is to shake it up and to and to really show the results and the evaluation of our work um, on the in the long term, and you know, just right here during this um, during this rough time. Thank you, Melissa. I know that. Um, if you are in our audience, you can submit questions in the Q&A function, and um, we'll keep on asking our panelists until we come to our time. And so I'm going to, you know, go back to Stacy. I know that this has been interwoven. DEI is interwoven and needs to be interwoven within every aspect of our business. But what are some you know, key recommendations or tips that you can provide um, that Canaries is maybe providing to, to both nonprofits and for-profits and how to implement these DEI strategies within your business? Yeah, no, thank you, Prisma, for that question. So first and foremost, uh, what we've noticed and what we highly recommend is, and I know a lot of the panelists have mentioned this, is just introspection, right? Being in that exploratory um, mode and being open and embracing to change. Um, I think, I, I believe Bob mentioned it or a few, a few of us, that there's a silver lining to what's been taking place, right? I know Ben, it, it, it's been disastrous, it's been disruptive in so many ways, personally, and professionally, but organizations and, you know, especially with the focus on not-for-profits is being in that, in that path of exploration to identify how to build those values um, we've noticed that some organizations are creating committees and they don't have to be large committees. It could be a subgroup that is looking to define what diversity, equity, inclusion means to that organization. Um, we acknowledge that DEI is different, right, in, in many organizations, but just having a standard universal definition of what that is and how that translates to employees, right? Making sure that your employees are part of the conversation. We understand at Canaries that race, talking about race, talking about discrimination, um, talking about just, you know, having a seat at the table, having your voice can be uncomfortable. These uncomfortable conversations turn to courage and then courage turns to team collaboration, which then impacts the productivity, impacts the health of your company. Um, we see, I always use the analogy of, uh, of health and how canaries could be like your x-ray tool, but it truly, it truly is that, right? The health of the company all starts with your employees looking at looking at it in an internal manner. So we urge non-for-profits to just articulate your own values. Um, it's okay to leverage your websites to show what your initiatives are. It's okay to be vulnerable and, and to say that these are these are our goals for 2021. Um, there's something about putting it on a website or sharing it on social media that translates to accountability, right? It's out in the universe, you manifest it and you want to move forward. So we, we encourage um, our organizations, our non-for-profits to look at their employee uh, workforce base. We also encourage the boards, the boards of those organizations to start questioning, right? It all starts with um, the internal questioning. So we always get uh, the question, well, how do we even start? Where do, where do we, 
what questions do we ask? And so I'm going to go back to the resources.canaries.com. And we spell canaries, by the way, K-A-N-A-R-Y-S. It's, it's the canaries, the bird, but it's, we, we changed the wording. Um, we do have a sheet there that pretty much is a how to start a courageous conversation with, with your team, right? I know a lot of leaders are, you know, just emotionally drained. Like, how do we even approach our employee? How do we approach our board? about reassessing policies, reassessing the composition of our, of our board. So we, I think um, having those honest internal dialogue is the first place to start and being okay to roll up your sleeves and um, embracing the good that, that, that you hear or the bad or the ugly, right? A lot of organizations are just ready to drive change. Um, I've lately, what I've been hearing from a lot of organizations is that they're looking for sustainable change. It's okay to have your town hall. It's okay to have a one-time training. I think it's a great foundation, but what do we do beyond that, right? What can we sustainably look at to impact change and drive diversity, equity, inclusion? So I, I honor you all. I know it's been a tough year and I encourage you all to just, to just have the courage. Um, start with your employees by asking, right? Um, secondly, your, your, your board, whether it's a national or regional local standpoint, um, having those, those conversations. So I would say those would be the, the, the top recommendations. Um, and then first and foremost is just building a, a safe, like a safety net is a safe place. For, um, for your employees to be able to share their sentiments, right? So whether that's on a listening session, um, we also, of course, at Canaries, we use a technology to have that mechanism for those that may not feel safe to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but just, just being yourself, bringing your authentic self. I think that more than ever, um, I believe it was either Bob or Melissa or, or, or Emily mentioned that, you know, we're given this opportunity to start all over and it's okay to start fresh. It's okay to um, look at your, your lessons learned from, from this year or the years before and how do you apply that for 2021. So I encourage you all to just try new things, try different things. Uh, specifically when it comes to, you know, your employees, yourself, and and your board or your, your team. Thank you, Stacey. And I think, uh, I, you know, these workshops, we also saw, uh, you know, when we started them, we saw them as an opportunity for all of us to learn, right? And I think with that, you know, I know that we talk about it, and we talk about diversity, and we, we see that there are definitely some needs in some organizations, and, you know, definitely, um, we know that a lot of us on this um, on this panel, we're addressing them in different ways. Um, so I want to go back into the conversation of like, what are the top needs of these grassroots organizations? And this question is from Bimnet. Um, you know, we we know that a lot of groups are doing great work. They may not have. Um, they may need a lot of help um, with some of that um, ground floor. Um, you know, those those business functions, but but I know they're doing a lot of great work. And so how can we support these organizations? Um, obviously we hope a lot of them are on this call, um, but we'll turn it over to Vimet and hear what the State Fair is also doing to support those organizations. No, for sure. So um, top need, of course, I think everyone will agree is funding, 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 right? Like any way you can do that. But I'd love to talk about like funding through in-kind and expertise and people power, right? Like the actual presence of people who have that knowledge being a part of that process as well. Um, and I'll get back to that in just a second. PPE, right? Um, while um, a lot of businesses and others got to shelter in place or closed down. Nonprofits were right there with the hospitals. The narrative just wasn't covering it and not being able to close down. If you close down a pantry, people don't eat, right? If you are shutting down your daycare systems, that means parents don't work. So um, I think the incredible need for PPE is in the nonprofit community as well. They are serving these families and communities and they don't have the necessary or all of the necessary um, resources to stay safe. So if you, um, we've been working on kind of a larger like supply chain management process to like get a bunch of those do resources down to that community. But I think that's another way, like if your company provides, I don't know, hand sanitizers, I'm thinking about maybe some CSR way to get that into those nonprofits 
or if you have a match, you know, make, maybe making a plea for the match to be a, a Dallas org. So I think PPE is um, a major one. I already talked about the support for students, but I can't emphasize it enough. Um, the reality is like, you know, like there's not just a problem that's addressed in isolation or in silo. It's like you have to think about the entire ecosystem. And so even if you're an organization that supports like adult health, it's the likelihood that they have children or grandchildren is high. And the fact that they are at home not having access to Wi-Fi to like actually learn is a real thing. Or not having a supervised person that's actually teaching them is a real thing, right? Like we used to talk about like the summer slide, right? Like this um, regression in learning that takes place in the three months where students are out of school. Well, we're seeing that at years level now, right? Like this one year of disrupted learning or eight months may affect, you know, the ability for students for the next few years. So I think thinking about support for students, so how can you support students? And a lot of these things you can actually do from the comfort of your home. So if it's just signing up to like participate in a mentoring shift or, um, signing up to support parents like in their efforts to either educate their students or get their students involved in a diverse programs. Like imagine being a student and sitting at a computer for eight hours on your core subjects. Like your mind is not necessarily stimulated, right? Like I wouldn't even enjoy that as an adult. And so what are some ways that we can bring diversity in the type of learning they have in different formats of learning, but also bringing back the things that they love? How do we bring coding and like maintain athletics? And, you know, some of these, like we need to be creative around that. And so think about ways that you can offer that to a local school or summer program. Um, Tim, at, at, you know, so many great suggestions. Yes, I, know that I think those are my top. Time, and then I'm realizing we have a couple of questions here from yes. the audience and I want to be sure that we all share, you know, some final words. And so I guess, you know, we'll go to this question um, from the audience um, that is asking for suggestions. Um, you know, there, there are organizations that have had to hire, um, hire um, employees during this time and, um, and you know they they've hired them and maybe they've shut down come back I, do you have any advice does anyone on this call have advice for those um that have been hired during a pandemic um i'm looking at bob emily they're different um maybe our legal implications things to share there financial implications maybe in thinking about 2021 I, um, as someone, we've added folks to our team during the pandemic. We actually had someone start the day everyone went home. Um, so financially, legally, I don't have a ton of context, but I think we're all looking at how employees stay engaged, how we all stay engaged, how we're all doing our work. And it's going to look different bringing somebody on today than it did uh, but before all this started, so just being intentional, we talked a lot about intentionality, but being intentional and, and bringing those people into your group, it can get really easy for us to take for granted what naturally gets shared and learned being in the office next to each other. So it uh, probably doesn't help much in terms of a finance side of things, but we brought people onto our team and have had to work very hard to make sure we're giving them all the opportunities they would have had if we were in person. Thank you. Well, I, I know that um, I want to open it up for everyone, all of you on our panel to share maybe one, one, you know, recommendation, one tip, um, you know, we only have about five minutes left in, in this workshop. I know time moves quickly. And so, you know, just one recommendation, one best practice um, as you're looking into, or reminder, as you're looking into 2021, I know that um, there are budgeting implications, legal implications, all kinds of things, fundraising we've heard a, a lot about. And so um, we can start with Melissa, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your one tip, and then we'll do this lightning round and, and close out this workshop. Absolutely. Thank you, Prisma. Um, I honestly tell your story. That is that is the tip. Make that um, tell your story for your um, for your donors, for your fundraising, um, show your impact. That is going to be, um, it's always been huge, but it's going to be huge in helping you plan for the next year. Anyone else want to jump in? Bob, you look like you're ready to jump in. Uh, 
maybe we'll go over to to someone else. I can go. I was going to say this is actually my last thing. I didn't get to finish is um, for the nonprofits and also for those listening is like find ways to add value through your professional expertise and consulting. That's like probably the biggest thing right now is that as people are unable to pay for these services, if you just could use your knowledge, your proximity, and just like volunteer a few hours, like I think that's like probably the biggest need and the biggest way you can help them in plan for 2021 is like your professional expertise in and, and anticipating some of the challenges, but also finding some solutions. So I think that goes both ways and same for nonprofits. You don't have to have funding, um, find people who can um, offer that as well. Thank you. Uh, Bob, are you ready now? Mm -hmm. I think he's, uh, we'll go to, there he is. Oh, I, I still think he's having some technical audio issues. So Stacy, why don't you go for it? Yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm gonna circle, uh, close the loop here. Um, be, you know, be kind to yourself, be graceful with uh, the situation that we're going through right now with the pandemic. I think that um, the pandemic has made, uh, going back to diversity, equity, inclusion, all these issues even more apparent um, with COVID and the recent Black Lives Matter. Um, it has highlighted the inequities of our society. So just being mindful, um, acknowledging, being kind to yourself um, and, and vulnerable, right? Um, I think that now more than ever, the focus will now be on, on, on engagement. I know that Emily uh, did alluded to this, employee engagement will be very important. Um, I know budgeting can be somewhat of a challenge when it comes to looking at these issues. But as I mentioned, it and, 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 and Ben it also mentioned, leveraging your expertise, um, Again, I invite you all to visit that free resources page. There's a lot of information there where you can start uh, engaging employees, having safe voices, having courageous conversations, um, and then supporting one another in, in such a critical time that we're in right now, um, finding the positivity and the silver, silver lining in, in what we're going through. Um, so I, I invite you all to just have these conversations um, and thank you all for having me today. I appreciate it. Well, I, I know, Emily, if you want to make a quick comment, now is the time. <laughs> no pressure, right? Um, I just, just to add on top of everything else, we have a lot to do, and there's no way we're going to be able to do it all. So really, if you're in a nonprofit, if you're in your organization, go back to your strategies, go back to your mission. And when you find yourself getting pulled, that's going to be what keeps you grounded. So just take time to find that grounding, to get set. You know, I put sticky notes on my computer, whatever it may be, just to bring you back to that when times get tough or when you feel, feel it spread in or reaching out. Thank you. And I know that Bob um, shared with me in the chat that this is a time to refresh your organization, right? If you haven't already started that process, 2021 is definitely the time to do that um, or to do it now and, and, and 2021 being a, a different year. And so the market is incredibly forgiving and, and take the risk and be creative. And I know that, um, you know, we're all expressing that creativity. I wanted to close out this panel and thank all of our panelists for joining us today. I know that we could continue on this conversation for, for days, I'm sure. Um, so thank you for joining us. And also I wanted to remind you that Giving Tuesday is coming up. So if you haven't already started to look at that, um, please, please do for your own organization or find an organization to support. Um, and also for SVP Dallas, um, we would we have another series called the Response Series, and we will be announcing our next conversation soon. Um, so please um, look at svpdallas.org, and um, you know, please if you feel inspired to to get involved, um, there's definitely an organization that you can plug into. And if you're interested in becoming an SVP partner, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to assist you there. Of course, thank you again to Something Good Consulting Group and Right Connector. We cannot do it without you. And um, you know, thank you in the spirit of gratitude. We, we appreciate you so much. And um, of course, we have so much to share today and we're at our time and so, you know, I appreciate every panelist and every um, audience member today, and we hope to see you again soon.